You've heard the news. The globe is warming. Sea levels are going to rise. Does that mean that all these people are going to drown? I'll be okay. I've got a life jacket and a raft. But are all these other people going to die? This video played at the Copenhagen Climate Conference this week certainly suggests terrible things are about to happen. Oh my goodness, does this mean we must immediately change our sinful ways? Ramp up green energy by green cars? Al Gore says yes. Temperature increases are taking place all over the world and that's causing stronger storms. We have to act together to solve this global crisis. But what if it's not a crisis? And now, the man who shatters conventional wisdom, John Stossel. Good evening. Are you afraid of the climate crisis? If I only listened to politicians like Al Gore, I'd be afraid, too. Very afraid. But after years of consumer reporting, I've become skeptical of these scare stories. Remember the Y2K scare? The year 2000 was going to break all the computers. Planes were going to crash. What happened? Nothing. Remember the breast implant scare? Lawyers and the media said silicone implants were poisoning women, causing cancer, autoimmune disease. Some women were so scared they used razor blades to cut out their own implants. Implants were then banned. But the truth? Turns out they didn't cause those problems. Implants are back on the market. But the scares keep coming. SARS, tsunami, bird flus. Let's think about bird flu. They told us that thousands of people were going to die as the flu passed from chickens to people. But no Americans died. Before that, the scare was mad cow disease. People were afraid to eat beef because our brains were going to rot. Before that, it was the pesticide scare. Insecticides are causing cancer. They're going to make us all sterile. Frog testicles are shrinking. The media do hype everything. That's one reason I've been skeptical about the global warming scare. But global warming is no myth. The globe has warmed over the past hundred years, and a lot of serious scientists are worried. People in this audience are worried. You're worried. I am. Because? Uh, Well, I'm concerned that as we we have more warming, that the systems we've relied on by the planet to clean our water and our air, that they might shift and change, and and we won't be able to adapt quickly enough to the change that we've relied, the systems we've relied on for many, many years. You're an environmental science student? I am, at NYU. You also? Yes. And what's your concern? Uh, My concern is very similar to Carrie's. I think that um, society relies on a lot of natural systems. And as you stated, there has been a noticed uh, increase in temperature and uh, actual warming. And we do have this issue of greenhouse gases and the connection between carbon emissions and the increase of temperature. And I think that these systems that we rely on are not going to be there in the future. And the social and economic costs that we're going to have to face in the future are going to be very severe. All right, well, system breakdown. Jerry Taylor is an energy analyst for the Cato Institute. These are frightening ideas that if our cleansing systems break down. But you're not that worried. Not particularly. Uh, There have been about 13 studies published by uh, academics in the literature, which try to translate what all this warming might mean for human well-being over the next century. And of these 13 studies that have been published, they estimate, four of the estimates, are that the economy would actually improve if we have a doubling of background greenhouse gas. How can it improve? Well, because we might have longer growing seasons. We might have more rain in places which are currently dry. More people die from cold weather-related events than from warm weather-related events. We'd spend less money on heating our homes, things like that. Uh, there are nine, nine estimates that things would be, slightly, would be worse under climate change. Four estimates of things would be better and a couple that would be about the same. The bottom line is, is that over the next 100 years or so, these studies suggest that we may gain or lose about one year's worth of economic activity. Now, that is an issue, but it's not the most significant issue that I think we need to worry about. But this just doesn't jibe with the stories I've been hearing. What what about sea levels rising? Uh, Here's a clip from Al Gore's movie. He says they'll rise 20 feet. This is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. This is what would happen to San Francisco Bay. 
a lot of people live in these areas. He says this is consensus thinking. Well, if we go by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the uh, organization that won a Nobel Prize with Al Gore that issues uh, reports every three or four years about the state of the science, uh, their consensus thinking in that report, the most recent one, is that sea levels may go up by somewhere between half a foot and two feet over the next two, uh, next hundred years. So Nine. his movie says 20 feet, and they say half a foot to two feet over the next hundred years. So there's a big discrepancy between the story Al Gore tells us and the story the IPCC tells us, at least over a near-term time horizon. And a foot sounds significant. Well, yeah, uh, but in the 20th century, we saw about a foot sea level rise as well. And if you were to put a list together of all the most important things that happened in the 20th century, a foot increase in sea level probably wouldn't make your list. And most of us didn't even notice that there was a foot rise. Didn't notice it. We adjusted and adapted, which is what societies do. Uh, these are not uh, monumental problems that are outside our ability to uh, handle as they arise. All right, but what, what about, like, you know, let's say the worst does happen. Let's say Greenland melts, then the ice in the Antarctic melt. Then you would have a huge increase. Now, that, the strongest argument for worrying about climate change is that there may be some extreme events that occur down the road. And we don't know what the chances for that might be. The latest IPCC report says there's about a 3% chance of runaway warming, you know, 6 degrees Celsius or 11 degree Fahrenheit warming over the next 100 years. And that could lead to really big sci-fi kind of disaster scenarios, a 3% chance. Uh, some people, however, think it's more than that. James Hansen at NASA thinks it's maybe 7, 10, 12, 15, 20 percent. Uh, other scientists, uh, like Richard Lindzen at MIT, thinks it's probably more like 0.3 percent. So it's very hard to know how to deal with something when you're not just dealing with risk, which you can normally calculate, but uncertainty. And there's a lot of uncertainties in climate change. So there are some people who think we need to hedge our bets. Yeah. Better safe than sorry. Why not? Well, there was a very good column about that just the other day by Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, where he laid it out very nicely. He said that uh, during the Iraq War, or right before the Iraq War, Vice President Dick Cheney said that even if there's only a 1% chance that Saddam Hussein would get weapons of mass destruction and pass them on to al-Qaeda or use them against the United States, we'd have to act. And Thomas Friedman said we need to think of climate change the same way. Even if there's only a 1% or 2% chance that it could turn into some disaster story, we have to act. Be cautious. Right. We have to be cautious. Well, the problem here that Tom Freeman ignored in his op-ed is that being cautious has consequences. Being cautious and invading Iraq to reduce that 1% chance does kill people. And similarly, to act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is also going to have a cost. These are not risk-free operations. What about the emails, Climate Gate, the revealing found emails from climate scientists? One wrote... I'd like to see climate change happen so the science could be proved right, regardless of the consequences. Well, does, does this change the science? Not, I mean, that, that particular email just demonstrates the scientists are human. We all want to be proven correct in retrospect. We all want uh, people to say, you know, I doubted you at one point, but now I don't. We all want so that's Earth not to disturbing. die to be proven right? Well, that, that, what is disturbing a bit is that uh, Phil Jones, the author of that email, uh, if you ask him what climate change would mean, he would draw up disaster scenarios that come right out of Hollywood. Uh, and he's saying in that email he wants to see those occur despite the consequences because he wants to be proven right. That is a pretty, a pretty bracing statement. I'm not sure I would have made it. But it doesn't change your opinion that the globe is warming and that this is a real problem. Well, what the, e the, the most disturbing thing about those emails is what they suggest about the misconduct within the scientific community. The most important thing about the scientific process is that your work can be replicated. If I do a study, if I do a, uh, an experiment, I publish the results, then you can get my data and you can see how I did the experiment, then you can try it, see if you get the same results. But what's going on here at East Anglia, where these emails came from, is that people were saying, I'm not going to give anybody data. People want to re replicate my work? Too bad. They can't. Oh, I have to turn it over? Well, I'll contaminate the data first, so I'll make it impossible for them to replicate. And then if I can't do that, I'll just delete data to make sure that nobody has a shot at checking my homework, as it were. That's not science. Now that's advocacy. That's something lawyers who would be subject to legal sanction might do. That's not what we think of scientists as doing. All right. But the bottom line, you're saying do nothing? 
What I'm saying is that we should keep an eye on the problem because, as you say, the climate is changing. The globe that seems to be sounds like do nothing. I hear them in the audience saying, oh, he's a tool of the coal industry. Well, we need to think about risk in the same way we think about it in any other, any other context in our lives. Most of the people who say we have to act to stop climate change are people who, when faced with very similar risk calculations in other areas of their lives, say foreign policy, would recoil and say, my gosh, no, that's the Bush foreign policy. That's disastrous. All right, but speaking of that, are you a tool of the coal industry? Does the Cato Institute get funded by them? About 90-odd percent of our money comes from individual, corp- individual contributions, not corporations, so no. Okay. I wish that Al Gore were here to debate him and me. We, we asked Vice President Gore, and his office sent this email saying, it's very difficult to decline invitations such as yours, but it's an unfortunate inevitability of the growing influence of the climate crisis message and the demand of Mr. Gore's time. We do apologize. Come on, Mr. Gore, the idea that you don't have time, it's pretty silly. You have time to go on programs like Saturday Night Live. It's not a time issue. Truth is, you won't debate anyone. You've been asked lots of times, but you always say no. But if you do ever want to debate, we'd love to offer you the airtime. We will give it to you. I'll give you a special phone number that goes to this phone. Glenn Beck has that red phone for the president. For you, Mr. Gore, the green phone. I await your call. So while we wait, coming up, I will tell you how you can get a free golf cart. I got one. And simple. Now, the weather report. I actually have no clue what's going on in your area, but I can give you the global temperature report. Scientists have used satellites to record global temperatures since the 70s. Some still use data from the ground, but what's good about satellites is that they're not stuck in one place, so they cover the whole globe. And according to the latest satellite data, current temperature, 24.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that is about half a degree warmer than the 30-year average, which might be scary if I didn't know that climate always changes. Here's a graph of the last 10 years. You can see there are constant changes. The peak temperature occurred 11 years ago. Earth has actually cooled slightly since then. But if you go back further, you can see the slight warming trend. So, Jerry Taylor, there is a warming trend. There are risks. Students talked about systems breaking down. Why not a carbon tax, cap and trade, just to slow the bad stuff from happening? Yeah, if there were a low-cost insurance policy we could buy, then it might be worth considering. But every single policy that's offered as that low-cost insurance policy does virtually nothing for temperature. For instance, uh, Tom Wigley, one of the scientists who was involved in this email controversy at East Anglia University, uh, ran some numbers about what the Kyoto Protocol would mean to global temperatures. And if everybody complied with that protocol, including the United States, global temperatures... Well, if everybody... First of all, not everybody signed. Right. And those who signed didn't all comply. But if, if everyone complied... If, every, if everyone who signed that treaty made good on their promises, including the United States, then global temperatures in 2050 would be virtually indistinguishable from where they would have been absent the treaty. And by 2100, it would have been only a small fraction of a tenth of a degree or so. But it would fair cost cool. the world world a trillion dollars. It costs the world substantial amounts of money. How much depends on whose study you believe. But the point is, to do anything about reducing temperature in a consequential way would require us to virtually abandon fossil fuels. And anything short of that just slows it down a nidge, not enough to make much difference. And in this, right, James I'm... Hansen is absolutely correct from NASA. It takes much more aggressive action than the kind the politicians are talking about if you want to reduce temperatures beyond a sort of uh, uh, trivial matter. So I bet people here would say, fine, abandon fossil fuels. You okay with that? Nodding heads. Oh, and some no's, but uh, abandon fossil. We have wind. We have solar. Well, the problem is, is we have wind and solar only because we subsidize the uh, heck out of it. If you take the subsidies away for those energy sources, even those trade associations that represent those energy sources would tell you their energy facilities go away. They can't compete in the market because they're just substantially more expensive than fossil fuels. So to abandon fossil fuels, renewable energy, is to substantially increase energy prices by definition. Now, we're relatively wealthy also, people. Would so it could even be possible? Wouldn't you have to have windmills across the whole country and every city? Well, 
It would be difficult because the wind only blows at certain times and places. It usually blows uh, at night, not during the day. That's where you get most of the wind power. But we need most of our energy during the day for cooling during the summer and that sort of thing. Uh, and it only blows during uh, certain pe during periods of the year, like in the winter. You get the more sun the is the only summer. out so much for solar. So power. They're, they're, and you can't store the energy. I mean, the great thing about fossil fuels is it's light, it's transportable. You We're can stuck use with it when you need it. Fossil fuels for twenty, fifty years. Well, you have to remember, renewable energy was the technology of the 13th century. We abandoned it for a reason. It was not practical for an industrializing society compared to fossil fuels. We could go back to renewable energy, but it would be costly, and it would cause some performance issues that I think would be very disruptive for the economy. And yet all these smart people are saying, we've got to do something. The people running the Copenhagen conference made that horrible video of the little girl screaming. They say we have to act. They have the girls say it. Please help. The world. Please help save the world. This save the world message they're playing at Copenhagen, it, it creeps me out. But even Republicans in this country, uh, the last Republican presidential candidate made it part of his campaign. Whether we call it climate change or global warming, in the end, we're all left with the same set of facts. The facts of global warming demand our urgent attention, especially in Washington. Are they just pandering for votes? Well, it's one thing to say that we need to worry about climate change or keep an eye on the problem or, you know, monitor temperatures, that sort of thing. But it's entirely another to offer scare campaigns like this. My favorite author is a guy named H.L. Mencken, and he once famously said that the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and thus clamoring to be led to safety by menacing them with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of which imaginary. That's what politicians do. They scare the living heck out of the voters and say, you need to vote for me because I will save the planet from climate change, from, terror, from uh, Islamic terrorists, from gay people who want to marry your children or something like that. All politics is is a constant campaign to scare heck out of people and politicians to offer themselves as the great defender against those fears. So there's nothing particularly unusual about politicians saying things like that. All right, well, some in our audience are chomping at the bit. They don't agree with that, and we will hear from you when we return. Taylor of the Cato Institute says the consequences of global warming might be not so bad. Some might be good. And some of the audience take issue with that. Would you stand up? And... Yeah. Uh, Jerry, I just wonder why you're focusing on the uh, less likely uh, natural catastrophes in the future and not on the immediate effects of uh, global warming on uh, the world's natural habitats and how they affect us as well. Well, most of the studies that have been done find that uh, it's the extreme scenarios. It's these science fiction sort of things about a collapsing uh, Antarctic ice sheet or a shift in the uh, Gulf Stream or something like that, that that allows us to justify government policy to do something about fossil fuel consumption. You take that stuff out of the mix, and there's very hard to build the case, because as of now, what have we seen from warming, say, over the last 100 years? Have we seen crop yields wither? No, we've seen record yields in crops. Have we seen human well-being diminish? No, we've seen people live longer than ever before. We see they're eating better. They're living better on all metrics. Climate change over the last hundred years has not been accompanied by a book of revelations uh, scenario of bad events. It's the extreme events that are a low possibility but high impact that are the real thing to worry about. That's why some reasonable people will disagree with me and say we need to hedge against these extreme events. But of course, in my opinion, that hedging comes at a cost, and the cost is probably too high right now, given what we know. You were shaking your head no. Um, I'd, I'd have to disagree completely. This is taking a completely um, American-centric vision, and we're, we're completely forgetting the rest of the world. Um, small islands in the Pacific, sea levels are rising. Um, you say there have been no crop failures. You're putting them East Africa is going, undergoing the, the worst drought it has in the past 100 years. Um, things are changing, maybe not in the U.S. right now, but... We'll, there, I mean, there are other countries in the world. 
Well, there's always droughts and there's always things that are bad that occur on a climate basis around the world. But in aggregate, uh, crop yields have not been going down. They've been going up along with climate change. But the point you raise is a good one. What about people outside the United States? And that is, to me, one of the most important issues here. Because after all, the, the highest death toll that we see, as estimated from climate change at present, that I've ever seen in the peer-reviewed literature is 170,000 people a year. I don't believe that number is correct, but let's just, let's just accept it for the sake of the argument. There are 3.2 million people every year who die from malnutrition because they're too poor to feed themselves. There's 1.6 million people every year who die because of poor water quality. There's about 1.4 million people every year who die because of indoor air pollution. Why? Because they don't have electricity. They burn biomass and dung in their, in their homes for heating and for cooking. These people are dying because they're dirt poor. And anything we do to increase fossil fuel energy prices is going to make it very difficult for them to ever climb out of poverty. As, as Larry Summers once said... And, and just to remind people, Larry Summers, who now works for Obama, uh, right. but before he worked for Obama, he said... Before he worked for Obama and had to watch what he said, uh, Larry Summers argued that... Don't, don't kid yourself that you're doing Bangladesh any favors by worrying about global warming. Poverty is a far bigger killer uh, than climate change or any environmental issues going to be in the foreseeable future. He's right. Did he convince you? No, because I think climate change is only going to increase these, these, um, these factors of poverty. Malaria, for example, because temperature rises will cause more incidence of malaria. Crop failure, it's, it's not just that temperatures are rising, it's that precipitation patterns are changing. There's less precipitation. So this is only going to make poverty worse. Well, actually, a lot of the problems you mentioned are problems that are more related to poverty than temperature. For instance, if you go to Singapore, you don't find very much malaria. You go 20 miles out of town through the rest of Malaysia, you find malaria. Why? Singapore is rich. I mean, rich places don't get malaria. There were, there were malaria scares in upstate New York in the turn of the 20th century. They're not anymore. Why? It's because we've, adopt, we've developed. With, because of public health systems and because of rising per capita income, we've improved public health tremendously. And That's because gonna... we used DDT and we sprayed you... it to kill the mosquitoes. We did that, too. The point is, is that you will, you, will, you will help human well-being far more by increasing wealth and by increasing people's ability to feed themselves. You're going to do by trying to turn down the thermostat with uh, reductions in fossil fuel use. Hi there. Along the same vein, um, with you talking about there being a correlation between development and our preparation to adapt to d these different changes, um, I'm afraid that, or my main concern is that our ability to, or our perceived ability to adapt to things like climate change has instilled in us a sense of apathy towards third world nations who do not have the same financial or other resources. So how do you feel about that? Uh, the, the point you make is a very good one. The reason that the uh, studies that have been done about the impacts of climate change uh, show that in northern Europe, in Russia, in China, even the United States, global warming might be a small net plus, but it will be a significant net minus to certain other countries. And the main reason is because these are poor countries that are much more heavily dependent upon subsistence agriculture, and they can't adjust as well. So your point's well taken. What do we do about that? Well, a lot of climate change is already baked into the models because of past emissions, which stay in the climate for a long time. The best way to handle what's already going to come, regardless of what happens in Copenhagen, is to allow these countries to grow rich so they can adapt better, like we can. So they're not so reliant on subsistence agriculture. So they can build cities that are more storm resistant, so that they can adopt their economies the way we have. This, and those are the things I think that are going to do a lot more good in the short run uh, than uh, anything with the, with the coal industry is concerned. What, what I hear you saying is we could spend all this money on cap and trade or a carbon tax, but we will be murdering people because we will be taking from the poor. Again, millions of people die every year because they're poor. If you increase energy costs, you're going to make it more difficult for these people to get out of poverty, more difficult to put to uh, electrify their homes so they don't have to rely on biomass for heating and cooking. You're going to make their suffering inestimably worse. That is a cold, hard fact. And the bodies associated with being poor, the body bags that pile up, are far greater than anything that's being piled up on climate change or that's ever going to, aside from some of these sci-fi scenarios that I've discussed earlier. Well, this makes sense to me, but what I hear watching TV and reading the paper is something different because I th hear we can do all these things painlessly just with a little American ingenuity and government can help. Of course, when government talks about doing something about global warming, that usually means subsidizing alternative energy like electric cars, which sounds good, but what it really means is taking your money by force and giving it to someone else. 
though today, in this case, to me. I was able to get, with your money, a golf cart. It didn't cost me a penny. I'll explain when we come back. alternative energy vehicle. You could get one, too, for free. Really? Free? Why is it free? Because it's an electric vehicle, so it runs on clean energy. Doesn't really, but we'll get to that. Now, you could have gotten one of these, too, if you knew about this scam. I mean, subsidy for alternative energy vehicles. I got mine from a dealership in Arizona. Here's the ad. You can see they're selling it for $6,490 which is exactly what the federal tax credit is for this kind of vehicle. And Colin Riley is the dealer who ran this ad. I I thank you. I now have my free golf cart, which I will enjoy. But why is this legal? We think it's a good reason for for, um, obviously several reasons. One is it helps the environment, which a lot of people in the audience would support. But really, this is one of those incentives that is actually giving back to the taxpayer so it's bailing out the guy who's been paying for the bailout. So for you to say that your, your, your vehicle was paid for by the taxpayers, it was really your tax refund going back to you. And uh, selling them for nothing, I assume you've had no, you've had no trouble selling these. We've had no trouble. It's, uh, it's a marginal effort that we're making, but uh, the truth is we're the only ones that have a credit that size that we're selling at that price. And the reason people don't buy 40 of them is because you got to put the money up front and get it back later. You do. Yeah, most people are throwing it on a credit card. But there is no limit to how many you can get. And uh, we've had people we, get We 40. called around the New York area in case you weren't going to get here today. Uh, and everybody just about was sold out. Sold out. It's That's popular. Right. It is popular. So you say this is good for the environment. But the electricity comes often from coal plants. It's true. It costs a you know, a penny or two a mile to drive these things. and Well, it, I'm sure it's cheap to drive them. Yeah. But it's nonsense. Even though our Congress has seen to give our money away for it, it's no better for the environment. The Natu- National Resource Council says it's, it's just as environmentally damaging because the electricity has to be produced. The truth is 80% of travel is in, within 10 miles of your home. So typically these are great alternatives to firing up the Suburban and cruising down the road. Well, I'm happy I have one. And and Jerry Taylor, this is the kind of subsidy that you think is a bad thing, a terrible thing, right? Right. I think if it makes sense for you to have an electric car because you only do traveling 8 to 10 miles from your home in a day, then there's no need for me to subsidize you. You can pay for it yourself. But if it doesn't make economic sense for you, if it doesn't make economic sense for manufacturers absent a subsidy, then no amount of government largesse is going to give it economic sense. It's a bad bet. Somebody once said to me, we don't have an energy policy in this country. But my answer was, well, we do have an energy policy. It's called the free market. If something is affordable, if something makes sense, people will buy it. Now, if you were to uh, talk to economists, they would tell you that the right way to address global warming, if you want to address it, is not by handing out free golf carts. The right way to do it is to price fossil fuels to it to account for what the damage they do to the environment and then to walk away and let consumers now face accurate prices with regards to their energy consumption and maybe they'll buy golf carts but maybe they'll buy more fuel efficient uh, priuses or maybe they'll just take the bus more frequently or maybe they'll buy a condo near their near their place of business so the transit costs are less maybe they'll do a lot of different things we don't know that they're going to buy golf carts but we know that they'll make the most efficient choices if you get the prices right so that's what you want to do you don't want to but hand that's out not what we stuff. are doing because we're subsidizing solar right. and wind power and you say nuclear power right because when we hand out gifts to people who make electric cars, people who sell electric cars, people who like to collect electric cars, you get very gratified people. You get gratified people who, who then say, by gosh, I'm going to vote for Thank this congressman, you, congressman who did me this wonderful favor. Right. But if you get prices right, all you're doing is increasing energy prices for people and then walking away. What politician is going to get reelected for that? Very few. And people say, oh, well, the oil oil industry gets a subsidy, but it's a fraction of what we give to wind and solar, and yet wind and solar is still 
fairly popular. You know, uh, several years ago, uh, the Cato Institute co-authored an op-ed with the Sierra Club calling for a zero subsidy energy policy to throw away what the Bush administration then was talking about, to throw away the Democratic alternatives, to just get rid of everybody's subsidies and let the best fuel win in the marketplace. If the Sierra Club can live with that, then I think we can all live with that. But unfortunately, not very many Republicans wanted to go that route because they're politicians like all others, and they love to give giant sacks of money to people who will then turn around and vote for them, like the nuclear power industry, uh, the coal yeah, industry. Some say now, companies. well, nuclear like power, zero carbon emissions, that's the answer. If you price carbon accurately, if that's what you want to do to address climate change. you take the subsidies out. Well, what we want to do is make people pay for the damages they do when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions if we're going to address climate change in that fashion. If we do that, then the costs of carbon-based fuels will go up. Uh, nuclear energy will be more cost competitive against those prices. Maybe they'll even be uh, a better market buy. But, but maybe it's not competitive now? No, not in the slightest. Without government subsidies, nuclear power would disappear in this country. It's one of the most heavily subsidized forms of energy You've in the United States. you nuclear power the uh, conservative solar power. Right. If you, li if you take a, a Greenpeace speech about solar power, scratch out solar power, insert nuclear power, and you've got a Republican speech about energy policy. We've got some laughter from the audience about that. <laughs> so what should we do? Wait? Get richer? See what happens? Adjust when it happens? Wealth creation, I think, is our best friend, both as far as reducing human misery as a general matter and for addressing environmental problems. The wealthier we are, the more capably we can adapt, the cheaper adaptation is going to be, and the less, less damaging climate change is going to be. And happily, the wealthier we are, the less frequently we will starve, and the less frequently that we will die from uh, indoor air pollution and problems like that, which are a much bigger problem for mankind than anything they're talking about in Copenhagen. Okay, well, I want to check. Did, did Al call? No. So we will keep seeing if he does on the green phone. Coming up, could we counter global warming with a garden hose? The authors of Super Freakonomics say maybe. And that's enraged some environmentalists. Why? Well, one of the super freaks will tell us when we come back. More only with the Fox Business iPhone app. Now shattering conventional wisdom. John Stossel. Sometimes I think the people who are screaming about climate change, disaster, are talking less science than religion. It's like there's a global warming church. And the dogma, climate change is this huge problem and we must cap carbon and tax carbon and change everyone's lifestyle and sign Kyoto. And if we do, we'll save the world. Stephen Dubner, co-author of Super Freakonomics, says there might be another way. What's that? Well, um, there are a portfolio of ideas that scientists and others, economists, others around the world are looking at. And they, they're generally called geoengineering. Now, geoengineering might not be the best word because it scares the living daylights out of a lot of people. It sounds like you're engineering the Earth, which is exactly what it is. If you think about it, though, we've already geoengineered the Earth by burning up about 300 million years' worth of fossil fuel in a, in a couple hundred years. If that's the problem, what's the solution? So we, we take a look at it and say, well... If we've caused this problem ourselves, and, and it could be a big problem, in other words, if global warming is a really big problem to worry about and the warming is the issue that we're concerned with here, put aside for a moment things like ocean acidification and so on, how do you stop the warming? How do you cool the earth if you need to? Geoengineering has a few ideas. Among them are some that any environmentalist could love, making the oceanic clouds more reflective, which would bounce more sunlight back into the, into the atmosphere and cool the surface. The one that we write about at some length in Super Freakonomics that has some people very, very distraught sounds repugnant. And we write about the idea that some ideas in society are repugnant for a long time until they're not. So this right, is one we don't know. Tell the idea, and then we'll discuss how repugnant it is. This idea, the repugnant part means you're putting chemicals into the stratosphere on purpose, sulfur dioxide, right? And what this actually does is tries to mimic the effect of nature, a volcano. When a big, big volcano blows up, which fortunately doesn't happen that often, if it did, if it did we wouldn't have, uh, you know, the weather that we have, wouldn't have the geography we have, and so on. Once and in a while... it would be cooler because of the... Stack in history, there has been a year without summer, which was a year, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago when there was a big volcano. In 1991, however, there was a volcano in uh, the Philippines, Mount Pinatubo. 
The sulfuric ash that went into the stratosphere actually ended up cooling the Earth for about two years, creates a kind of haze. So the idea of geoengineering is to create, literally take a kind of specialized garden hose, run it up into the sky 15, 18 miles, spritz out sulfur dioxide, a relatively very small amount, to recreate that volcanic eruption and thereby cool the Earth, if you need it. It's akin to, it's like when you build a new house, you want to do everything you can not to start a fire in the house. But if you have a fire, what you really want afterward is a sprinkler system. This is not a perfect fix to global warming. It's not a substitute for environmentalism. What it is, however, is a solution to global warming if the problem needs to be fixed fast, cheaply, and reversibly. A possible, perhaps dubious solution, but something to think about. And just by saying that, you've taken unusual heat. Yeah, I can't say we're, all the we're surprised. The I mean, in the book, we actually said pretty much what you said in the intro to this piece, that in a lot of ways, the effort to stop global warming has taken on the feel of a religion. And maybe religion is, is understating or overstating it. It's really the movement of it, taken on the feel of fundamentalism. And what I mean by that is when you're a fundamentalist, you cannot or will not brook ideas that even begin to challenge your kind of orthodoxy. So, yeah, there are certain uh, hardcore environmentalists on whose uh, hate lists we are now and will forever be, I'm afraid. Paul Krugman, you are unforgivably wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Brad DeLong, you should abjectly apologize. Yeah. Abjectly. I'll apologize for other things. Not for this, though, because we're right about this. I mean, I think what we're right about, having listened to Jerry earlier, I think the problem is once a topic like this becomes politicized, which it has been, obviously, you hear rhetoric on both sides that is kind of absent of rationality and absent of nuance. And we try to bring some rationality to the topic. Look, here's what I believe in. I believe in rational environmentalism. And I think that everybody here and all of us would, too. Is it a good idea to pollute less, to preserve the environment better, to create cheap and cleaner and better energy for more people in the world so that more people can prosper and live more responsible, more productive lives? Yes. Does that go against this kind of church of global warming as you've described it? Unfortunately, yes, it does. And just to be clear, when we talk about polluting less, I think of sulfur dioxide yeah. and soot. But carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas they're talking about, has been labeled a pollutant, but it doesn't hurt you if you inhale it. It is interesting. I, I have two kids. They're nine and seven. They come home from school, a school I like a lot, so if you're out there, don't kick us out. Um, <laughs> and, and my kids are learning in school that carbon dioxide is a poison. It's a poison. Now, it, when I was a kid, we learned that carbon dioxide was the lifeblood of the planet and that without it, plants would not grow and we would die. So, uh, like I said, the rhetoric gets a little bit overheated and I have to take my kids aside. Let's take some overheated rhetoric, I hope, from our audience. That's up next. Also, let's assume global warming is a serious problem and we humans are making it worse. What should we do? Right to the audience here. You're a little nervous about this garden hose full of sulfur dioxide? Well, I, would, I just wonder what the diversion of resources towards these engineering tactics would have on trying to curb greenhouse gas emissions when, if we accept the fact that they are actually causing problems. But if he's solving the problem, then who cares about greenhouse gas emissions? But that would also require continued investment in these, the, this type of engineering where you'd have continued in injection of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere for who knows how long because we're not addressing the core of the issue of greenhouse gas emissions. Stephen? Yeah, that's a great, great point. One, one of many very legitimate objections to geoengineering, by the way. I will say this. The cost objection is probably the smallest. What it actually costs to execute this plan to spritz the stratosphere with sulfur dioxide compared to even the, the gentlest carbon mitigation plan is the equivalent of finding a penny on the street, literally. It's a, you know, a couple hundred million dollars, perhaps, as opposed to a trillion a year or more going forward. That said, the environmental issues are separate, which would be if you start to do it and you need to continue to do it, it, might, it, it could create a variety of problems. Environmental problems on the one hand, and B, the, the more difficult one, which is an excuse to pollute. In other words... Think of it this way. When you wear a seatbelt in a car, do you drive more recklessly? Some people may. Others may not. So you have I to... I do. <laughs> 
You know, NASCAR drivers apparently do, too. We, we wrote about this once. After Dale Earnhardt's death, there were all these safety innovations brought in. What happened is once they were safer in the cars, they, the drivers had a tendency to crash more because strategically taking the risk was worth it, but they also knew they probably wouldn't die. So the, I'm not saying there aren't objections, but the point is with any inter intervention, with any help, with any innovation, there are costs and benefits, and you have to look at them. That's it. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering what happens if this sulfur dioxide system fails. You'll, uh, sulfur dioxide runs out of the atmosphere very quickly, and you would actually have catastrophic warming, uh, warming after that. Further, sulfur dioxide is actually an ingredient in acid rain. So we were talking about carbon fertilization and improved economic growth <coughs> because of um, at more carbon dioxide for the plants. Now you have this problem of, sulf of acid rain, even if the system doesn't fail. That could hamper our growth. Yeah, you would think that acid rain would, should be the first objection to putting sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. The, the reasons why scientists, including a Nobel-winning hardcore environmental scientist named Paul Crutzen, who is known as Dr. Ozone for having looked at the ozone, the destruction of the ozone there, when he looked at what happened at Mount Pinatubo, and he looked at our ability to cut down on our carbon. He said, there's no way we're going to be able to do it. And therefore, I reluctantly endorse the idea of sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere. I'm glad you brought up acid rain because people say, you guys in suits said, government can't clean the air. And there were plans to get rid of acid rain with laws that restricted <clears throat> sulfur dioxide use. It worked. Why won't these laws restricting carbon dioxide work? Jerry? Depends on how we're going to define work. I mean, the fact is, the, the reason we have a debate about how much it would cost to address climate change is because we can only make guesses about what non-carbon-based fuels are going to cost five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. So, for instance, if there were technological breakthroughs that allowed us to get cheap wind-powered electricity and a battery that could then take the wind that was generated or the wind electricity that was generated at night and then use it during the day or something like that, then we could address climate change at very low, little cost. We don't know what wind energy is going to cost 30 years from now. We can only make guesses. When economists pencil this stuff out, they generally assume today's cost will be tomorrow's cost after making some adjustments. It almost never is. <clears throat> and it almost never is. Now, that's not because government regulations change the trajectory of the cost curves necessarily. It just means that we can only guess about tomorrow's cost. It's not that we're always wrong in shooting in a high-cost scenario, by the way. In 1990, California passed a zero-emissions vehicle program where they mandated that a climbing percentage of the new cars sold in California have zero emissions, which would be a pretty neat trick. Well, it turns out it wasn't possible. And so California just said, oh, never mind, forget that. And they just, for, the law was just shelved, and most people didn't even notice. So it's not as if all estimates are off by overestimating cost compliance. In a lot of cases, they actually underestimate, but we don't hear about those stories because we just bury those laws. Jerry Taylor, Stephen Dubner, I thank you very much for being here. Again, I have to ask, why is climate change a crisis? The world has bigger problems. Let's say we accept that study by the World Health Organization, Jerry referred to, that claims 150,000 deaths from global warming. Compare that to the 3 million people who die from malnutrition every year, or the 1 million who die because of poor sanitation, and 1 million who die from indoor air pollution because they burn animal dung to heat their homes. That's why I get upset when the media and Hollywood get so hysterical about climate change. This affects every single one of us. And that's not something you can say about any other issue or any other crises. But so what? The world has bigger problems. And for a fraction of the cost of trying to stop global warming, we could improve the lives of millions by giving poor people vitamin supplements or raising living standards through freer trade. Some economists, including Nobel Prize winners, recently ranked 30 such life-saving reforms. Stopping global warming came in last. If global warming is a problem, our best defense is to be rich enough to adapt to it. If we try, as President Obama suggests, to reduce our greenhouse gases by precisely 83 percent, I don't know where he gets that number rather than 84, 82. If we do that, we're going to be much poorer. The billions we spent on the next Kyoto or cap and trade will make almost no difference for global warming. To spend that would be such a horrible waste. Thank you for watching. I'm John Stossel. Good night.
We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas, your examples of government gone wild, and join our studio audience. To do that, email us or call us 